Good morning. Uh, today, I wanted to talk to you about how we can use augmented intelligence as a co-pilot in the operating room. My name is Dr. St. Kelpy, and I'm in Northwest Medical Center in Tucson and Arizona, and I have no disclosures. The purpose of changing the way we do things in the operating room and bringing it to the 21st century has to be with absorbing the technology that we're using, but also use the technology to our advantage as a form of a co-pilot to make better decisions. And so I've always felt that the gestalt of um, our education and the experience, the 10,000 hours, that really wasn't going to be good enough. So I thought we could harness the power of the technology such as EEGs, waveforms, nearest monitoring, our ventilators and our echo machines in um, cardiac surgery to try to make better decisions. And what I'm going to describe is how we've harnessed all of this and put it into um, our AI lab and essentially um, drill down on key decisions to make it uh, real for us to make better decisions in our operating room. And really the purpose is to improve our decision-making. And um, most of the trauma that we inflict upon patients happens in the operating room. And when we try to do no harm, I think we should try to predict to do no harm uh, to as a prelude for getting better outcomes. And I think this will lead us to better personalized or surgical care. And I think that's the key message uh, that I want to uh, talk to you about today. And, um, you know, what I'm going to talk about really is how we built this uh, AI powered ecosystem. Uh, to make decisions in very close to real time. So we can influence what's going on with each patient in the operating room. And that personalizes our surgical care. So the things that we thought about was, well, what's the flow like of a patient um, seeing coronary artery bypass surgery? And um, can we minimize some of the complications? So for example, if we use EEGs, could we predict or more influence or diagnose neuroinflammation or um, to reduce things like uh, post-pump syndrome? Or uh, could we use Dopplers to identify um, tissue resistance to look at graft patency? Could we use uh, neuros monitoring um, and put that all together to uh, influence and see what happens, whether you're pulsatile or non-pulsatile, um, and does that actually influence the uh, factors for uh, renal failure? Um, of course, there's labs that are available, and we send that off every time in the operating room, along with putting our patients on ventilators. So could we use the ventilator settings in a more novel way to reduce post-operative inflammation, which the bypass circuit actually inflicts upon our patients. You know, one of the other biggest tools that we have in the operating room uh, for cardiac surgery is our echo. Well, could we use the echo in a better way to predict heart recovery or revascularization or regional wall abnormalities? And, you know, the other thing is that we send tissue off to our biobank, uh, which we then do metabolomics and genomics on. So how about if we take these ecosystem, this ecosystem and we, we stack all these features up and I'll show you how we do that to make a better decision for the patients. And going into each one more deeply, I think EEGs um, can actually, if we look at the sequence of alpha, beta, theta, and even gamma, ray, ga gamma um, waves uh, of patients who are on bypass, we can actually predict strokes, not just looking at their cerebral sats, because by that time it's a bit too late. Can we actually predict that something is happening? Uh, 
And the waveforms are a powerful tool to help us decide that um, by looking at the preamble of ischemia with the waveforms, uh, but also neuroinflammation. And, you know, could we do something in the operating room to help prevent that? So that's what one of these, this tool is for. The other thing that we're using is we're looking at positivity indices when we're looking at grafts during bypass surgery. And we look at the flow, we look at the the, the definition really of postile indices can be derived to give you an idea of what, what's going on with tissue resistance and tissue compliance. Um, when we, you know, when we, when we, you know, plug in a graft into that, into the irrigation system of the coronary arteries, it's very heterogeneous because you can't, you know, you hear from the cardiologist that you, you've got 80% stenosis. Well, yes, pi R4, but to the power of four gives you your flow and your resistance and your diameter um, across the, the valve, uh, across the, uh, the coronary artery. But truly, what is the longevity going to depend on of that graft? And um, if we're able to change that at the time of when we put the graft in or put it at a place where we feel we could um, have better downstream effects, uh, you know, there, there's many times that we sometimes put um, a grafts onto uh, coronary arteries that are actually clogged up and the graft fails. And so that is highly irritating as a, as a cardiac surgeon. So we're working on using positivity indices um, to do that. And how can we change the tissue resistance? Well, we've been using TMR. Um, transmyocardial laser revascularization, which increases uh, VEGF, which allows us to increase the um, microvascular status. And most of the problems that happen with people who are in heart failure or have scar or are diabetic are the tissue resistance. And so can we change that? So we're evaluating that in the operating room and we're trying to predict the areas in which we can do this much better. Um, with ECHO, we're using uh, myocardial work. And this algorithm is a relationship that we have with um, GE. And we basically look at our ECHOs before and after, say, revascularization. And we follow uh, the concept of myocardial work using tissue Doppler. And we do this in real time in the operating room. So we actually know when we've been successful at revascularizing the patient because we look at the regions to look at myocardial work. And we also uh, calculate the regional global strain, which is um, really powerful because we're also looking at building heart recovery and global strain essentially determines um, you know, uh, strain, which is basically uh, squeeze in uh, vertical, horizontal and twist um, of a muscle that's squeezing. And we can look at how much load there is on that muscle. And that changes whether you're doing a valve uh, in mitral valve surgery to change the pressures, such as the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, or you're looking at um, a revascularization for a muscle that you want to see improve. And we've got uh, papers submitted already, which actually shows our heart recovery uh, program on patients that are getting offloaded with uh, the impeller. And we use a surgical impeller, the impeller 5.5 uh, in the aortic position uh, with open heart surgery in sick patients who have ejection fractions less than 35 or 25%. And they are either undergoing bypass or valve surgery. Um, and we evaluate how we wean our patients to recovery uh, using this process with the Impala every single day with our weaning protocol. And uh, the initial tool and the baseline for this is in the operating room. One of the interesting projects that we've also got is using near monitoring to measure cerebral oxygenation, which of course everybody, everybody in the OR has. But what about if we slap that on to the kidneys? And if we do that, we're able to look at um, kind of oxygen delivery. And uh, that oxygen delivery uh, is what we calculate from the perfusion machine uh, before, during, and after bypass. Uh, but also if we change the modes, we are looking at 
does pulse tile flow have a difference on oxygen delivery? Does it reduce your renal failure? Uh, and so what we're also doing is we're looking at urinary um, uh, IGF B, uh, binding protein 7 and tissue factor inhibitor, which is um, uh, an MMP2, which essentially predicts using ELISAs at 0, 12, 24, uh, and seven, 48 and 72 hours, is this patient going to get AKI uh, or Q kidney injury before they actually do? And can we intervene uh, much earlier from three hours before we even know? And so we're doing this with neuromonitoring monitoring in the operating room uh, and looking at oxygen delivery with our patients. And that was uh, a really cool project we embarked on uh, to see whether mannitol would actually have an effect. And uh, our first student from Texas Heart, uh, first perfusion student, uh, Victor Mendoza, uh, this is his project. And what we're doing with our AI lab is we're looking at answering the question of whether mannitol um, actually has an effect and uh, on our kidneys, or is it just a placebo, or is it something that we just do it to make ourselves feel better? Well, we actually developed a protocol, well, he did, um, uh, to design that, uh, to answer that question. Uh, does mannitol have an effect? And is it hurting us, causing acute kidney injury or helping us uh, with the free radical scavenging uh, properties of mannitol as we all seem to think? And this is a heat map, which uh, looks at all the different parameters that we've got uh, evaluating uh, acute kidney injury. And um, we're looking at uh, intra, pre, and post-operative um, uh, stories, along with the morbidity, uh, sorry, the demographics of the patient. And we, we look at positive and negative correlatory factors, uh, which bear relevance and are significant. And so um, um, we, I'm not going to take his thunder away, but the key message that um, we found is that what we give in terms of net volume um, and crystalloids as well as ejection fraction all have significance uh, in whether or not we give mannitol uh, in his study of, uh, before and after bypass as we come off the cross clamp or just as a, as a cardioplegia in the cardioplegia solution. And are we making an effect? So we looked at two different doses and we found that there were mitigating factors which were positively and negatively correlated. And the nearest monitoring actually did help us um, decide uh, and uncovered a lot of what we found to be true. And I know that the purpose of me discussing this is not to take his thunder away, but it's to show you how complex um, our relationships can be and what our augmented intelligence or artificial intelligence unravels uh, is the complexity of the relationship uh, which is hidden and can have significance. For example, knowing what the pre-hydration status is of a patient um, has a positive relevance. We all know that cross clamp does as well, which is there, but the ultra filtrate volume as well as um, sodium levels are, are also important along with bypass times. And that coupled with other things that we do, uh, you know, when you're on a bypass circuit, uh, we often have uh, uh, in, in, inflict, as I said earlier, a lot of inflammation. That inflammation is um, can be quite damaging, say in patients who are already pro-inflammatory, such as heart failure patients. So we devised um, a way to induce a form of um, uh, vagal stimulation, which would allow, while we're on bypass, to keep the ventilator going. Uh, but at a much reduced rate and uh, a ratio that is akin to meditation while you're sleeping, while you're on the bypass machine. And um, there's many studies that show that heart rate variability actually increases. And there are many studies that actually show that there's a link between heart rate variability and inflammation. And so what we decided was 
well, can we quantify this? And we're looking at IL-6 and inflammatory markers pre and post surgery, uh, but we, uh, and pre and post bypass specifically, and people have been ventilated or not ventilated. And what we have found is also interesting in that our HRV does increase, uh, which is heart rate variability. And we calculate that with uh, various different waveforms, not just the EKG, um, but looking at different ratios with high frequency and low frequency ratios. But we have also found that the burden of inflammation is much reduced in these patients. And that's unpublished right now. Um, you know, as we also look at uh, our relationship with people like at the Broad Institute, um, very good guy called Puneet, who we are looking at uh, giving tissue uh, from our biobank from each patient. We are trying to look at the genomics, but genomics for me is also a little bit too slow. So, uh, you know, why would I? In, it's great that I can influence something that will change the left ventricular mass in a year's time after I've done a valve. And we all know this LV mass regression when we do uh, aortic valve replacements or mitral valve repairs. But um, how about if I try to use the tissue to try to get uh, data that's much more important, such as uh, proteomics and genomics and, I'm um, sorry, um, metabolomics. So we're looking at specific pathways, particularly in mitochondrial protection, um, which when we give cardioplegia would allow us to change the real-time status of uh, ATP in a heart that stopped or is beating. Um, and we're using that data to actually make better decisions. Well, it's great. We've gone through all of these things, but how can we actually tie this together? Well, we're actually um, streaming this data from the OR picture that I showed you at the beginning of the case, uh, beginning of the presentation to uh, show that we've got um, these waveforms, but also these static demographics, which go through the electronic health record through HL7 feeds into our AI lab and where we've got a data warehouse. And in that data warehouse, we're using a lot of analytical tools. We've got relationships with Data Robot and with Google. And it's on that platform uh, and Amazon Web Service. So we've, it's all under HIPAA firewalls and um, we are trying to develop predictive risk scores, predictive scores for stroke, and predictive scores for um, morbidity and mortality. Because frankly speaking, this STS risk score, which you see in every h &P before surgery of a patient, is frankly crap. It's not predictive at all. It doesn't tell you anything. Um, and it vaguely simulates a story of risk, which is not truly accurate. And I feel uncomfortable telling my patients that they've got a 1.4% chance of um, mortality, and which is frankly not true. And so it um, kind of emboldened us to try to do something a little different, which is what led to this uh, whole idea and this project um, with trying to then make real-time decisions in the operating room. And this just summarizes kind of the story of what we've got from our operating room. And by the way, we've got similar formulae in the ICU and in our step-down unit um, with all these monitors that we're working with Nihon Coden and it streams to the lab. So we've got petabytes of data from our electronic health records with medications, our op reports, our lab results, the nephro checks I talked about earlier, um, device data from our monitors, our perfusion uh, system um, is feeding into our uh, G9 monitors in the operating room where we can see the positive flow. And so now we're doing time series analysis and we're using our waveforms from our EKGs, EEGs and our ventilators and we're looking at data from our echoes and also preoperatively from our CT scans and our ultrasounds uh, and our angiograms. And so this gets fed into our data lake and where there's a lot of unstructured data. And as we do that in our cloud in the lab, we drill down on projects. Uh, say, for example, looking at graph patency, we're looking at creating a data mart where we develop our algorithms for positivity index. And we then say, okay, well, how can we stack all of this information 
um, that we've got of this one patient in from multiple modes into a neural network. And we're using various algorithms such as uh, PyCarrot, various uh, uh, neural networks, um, which uses static and dynamic data. And we're then able to personalize a predictive score. And this video, which is four minutes long, summarizes the future of what we're doing. So I thought I'd show it to you to end the presentation before I ask for any questions. As we stand here at the dawn of the fourth industrial revolution, the potential of AI is evident, but the value is yet to be unlocked for so many. People like you, seekers, solvers, with unrivaled expertise in your field, you're driven by curiosity, but where do you start? The race is on to bring the power of machine intelligence to as many innovators as possible. Our unique machine brain was purpose-built for continuous learning by 600 of the best and brightest data scientists and engineers, all united behind the idea that AI won't reach its true potential until the power of AI is available to all. So how do we do it? It begins with pattern recognition in a learning session, rapidly accelerating your model and blueprint development through our Chapman Challenger approach that ranks your models to help you find the best insights for your desired outcomes. But models are fueled by data, and to put it simply, data is experience, your organization's experience. This needs to be transformed rapidly into actionable insights while remaining secure and within your control at all times. Regardless of where your data is, Data Robot is able to help you harness that knowledge on-prem or in the cloud, structured or unstructured, text, numeric, geospatial, visual, and more. But unlocking transformational growth isn't possible till you can scale models into production with confidence, enabling continuous learning and real-time improvement. As a result, your learning session gets smarter over time. But as the data robot learning core evolves, those learnings are shared with all of the sessions, increasing the collective knowledge of the entire machine. And what does it look like when all of these sessions are running in real time? Let's take a look. In an effort to inspire our R&D product, customers and partners, we created a real-time 3D visualization of our data robot machine brain. Visualizing data helps humans process and make decisions more confidently. Visualizing in three dimensions over time unlocks even greater ways to explain insights and drive action. And seeing the entire dynamic system in concert shines a light on the real-time potential of the human and machine intelligence revolution. It can be a bit overwhelming at the scale, but Data Robot handles all this complexity so you don't have to. Freeing up human resources to focus on the most challenging and interesting problems while enabling better trusted critical decisions. Empowering citizen data scientists to be the human heroes of the machine intelligence revolution. Bringing the impact of AI out of the box and into our lives. Helping regular people through revolutionary advances in health, finance, climate, government, and so much more. They are the human heart beating within our machine brain. There is nothing artificial about the problems of the real world. So should we settle for just artificial intelligence? Would you trust your doctor if you practice artificial medicine? Would you trust me to perform surgery on your heart if the experience I had was artificial? Well, I'm not a voiceover artist. I'm a heart surgeon. Today, when I make decisions on my patients, I use their lab data, their images, and their waveform data. But this is too slow. Tomorrow, we as physicians need to make better, faster human decisions, decisions we can trust. But we can do this by leveraging the power of augmented intelligence. And if we do so, then we would be able to predict medical interventions and deploy preventative strategies in healthcare. You know, the impact of this on human lives, if we get this right, will be immeasurable. I'm excited to work with Data Robot because together 
we're able to make augmented medical decision making. This is a new formula which will be the future of healthcare driven by AI. I'm Dr. Zane Kalpi and I'm a citizen data scientist. This relationship is important because um, I think industry drives the future of healthcare and we've got to embrace it because I'm happy to announce that we, we are also um, our, the first partner in a health incubator with Data Robot where we're able to push forward um, the new way of thinking. And I hope this presentation um, opens your mind to uh, new ideas that we do and for things that we do every day. So with that, I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much.